Welcome back to the final part of the series preparing for an ocean crossing. This one is about safety gears and procedures. Welcome back guys. So we need to continue with our checklist for preparing for an ocean crossing. B, what's the number two golden rule? Stay on the boat. That's right. Thank you, princess. Again, another very simple, obvious rule. But if you follow it, you will survive. You will make it to the other side. So that of course begs the question, how do we stay on the boat? We'll show you how we do it on Jupiter. We use harnesses, tethers, and a jack line. And all a jack line is, is a line that runs around the boat that we clip our tether onto. So I'll show you how I use a jack line. Uh, I just use 10 mil uh, polyester double braid long enough to run around the deck so that you can move around the entire boat. It's very simple and cheap. Here's a tip to save you a few bucks. No need to pay the expensive prices in the chandlery for your tether. It can be $70 to $100 for a tether in the uh, chandleries. Just go to your local rock climbing shop or outdoor shop and buy some strong webbing. Like this is like a double layered webbing. Very strong. It costs about 4 or $5 a meter. Maybe you need one and a half to two meters or seven or eight feet. And to make the loops on the end, you're just using an overhand knot. Anyone can do that knot. And it is strong. And when it is under load, it just tightens on itself. All you have to do is put a few stitches in the tail, just so that the tail never moves and doesn't come undone. Otherwise, it's bomb-proof. I use this in rock climbing. And then you've got yourself a tether. Also, carabiners from a rock climbing shop obviously very reliable, lightweight, and cheaper than a chandlery. So what happens if we can't follow that rule? What happens, and it's always by accident, there's a man overboard, or a princess overboard. That's even worse. We have to firstly hope that they're wearing flotation equipment, life jacket, ideally with an AISMOB beacon. Uh, they are expensive, but they are literally lifesavers. If man overboard occurs at night time without an AISMOB, there's very little chance of saving that person. Very little chance. But we equip ourselves with safety gear that will help us survive. Wearing our life jackets. Our life jacket must have a light. The standard light that comes with these life jackets, if you have one with a light, is usually 
insufficient. It's better than nothing, but it's they're insufficient. Ideally, you want a strong torch. So the person in the water can shine the torch at the boat and immediately be found their location. Waterproof torch, of course. Better than that is an AIS MOB. With one of those, even if the person is unconscious, we can find them. Just want to show you the life jackets that we wear when the going gets tough. Uh, these are manual inflation life jackets, but I fitted these with man overboard AIS beacons. So we can have a look in here. Looking a little bit rusty. Anyway, when you are overboard, you simply pull down on this toggle which will release this antenna and this will automatically activate uh, AIS signal which the ship or Jupiter 2 can see on the screen so even if you've drifted away we can home in on this signal it's also got a flashing light in it now this one is a Chinese brand which I bought two of these they're about 95 US dollars compared to this one which is a ocean signal version and it's 400 US dollars but we've tested both of these and we're going to test these again before we head out across the South Atlantic make sure you've got some reasonable quality lights you'd never want to be short of a light when we're on a night passage um, Waterproof is good, but not ultimately necessary. Um, spotlight is really good, handheld and portable, just for signaling other boats or a ship that may be coming your way. That's really bright. Make sure you got your lights. Some other safety gear that you uh, will want to get, just depending on what part of the world it is you're crossing in, is uh, wet weather gear. It can get cold and when you're wet and it's windy you can lose heat and if you're stuck on the wheel because of autopilot failure which happens then you're going to want some nice dry clothes um, don't have to spend much and and with yachting you can spend a heap if you want good wet weather gear but just from decathlon we got some nice jackets I think this was like $60, you know, it's a good jacket. The uh, princess has got a nice one. Maybe she'll model it for us. <laughs> so you want jackets and you want pants. Now these plastic pants, going moldy now, but cost about $10 in South Africa. So you need to be able to cover up and stay dry. You might also want some boots, just depending uh, I don't have any and we sailed around uh, Cape of Good Hope and yes it was a bit cold and I sort of wished I had some sort of boots but I just like bare feet on the deck because I can feel if I'm going to slip or not slipping whereas with boots I think they just take you by surprise. Anyway, personal choice but you need some wet weather gear. I guess most people know what this is for, a horseshoe life boy. You can also get the circular ones. Uh, the important thing is that you give it to the man overboard. It's actually the first step in the man overboard procedure is to throw him some flotation. This one here has got reflective tape so that it's visible at night time. Also helpful at night time is this floating light. The battery lives up here so and the shape of it makes it float like that which activates the light quite visible from a long distance away but it is low down in the water it's only sitting here in the water so any waves in between you and the light is going to make it invisible but keep a good look out because it's going to float up and down on top of the wave at some stage <laughs> This complex piece of equipment is called a fanboy, and it's basically a marker that 
you throw in the water where the man overboard can then swim to and with the flag high above the waves can be easily seen. Also important at night time, flag is no use. But with this reflective tape, I've got three of these, it really shines brightly when its uh, torch beam is shone on it. So this part is the float, the bottom is the weight, and that's how it stands up in the water. Okay, so what if we disobey rule number two? Accidents happen, what if we have someone go overboard? Establish man overboard procedures to rescue that person. It's absolutely critical in an ocean passage. There are no other boats in the area that's gonna help you. Their only chance of survival is if you can turn this boat around and go and get them. What we're gonna show you is our initial actions for our man overboard procedure. And that should be fairly similar to all boats. The second part of the procedure, that would be to go and pick up the man overboard. There's just so many different variables. There is different sail combinations, there's different wind strengths, different wind directions. How many crew do you have on board? So many variables. So uh, we're not gonna go into detail on the second half of how to pick him up or how to maneuver the boat to go and pick them up. We're just gonna show you the first ones and then maybe a, a couple of thoughts on the second half. So let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna run you through our procedures on Jupiter, which should be very similar to any other vessel. The immediate actions for a man overboard. The first person to see a man overboard yells out, man overboard, very loud so that any other crew who are not looking are suddenly aware. They can come and assist. At the same time, that person grabs the life buoy and throws it overboard towards the man overboard because depending on your speed, Jupiter often sits at 10 knots or more that's a long distance for him to swim if you've delayed throwing the life buoy. So do it as soon as possible. The next step is to drop in the Dan buoy and that's the flag that he will swim to and you will be able to see that flag from a mile away perhaps. The next immediate action is to jump to the, the plotter, the chart plotter and push the MOB button. Make sure you know where it is on your plotter. On the Ray Marine, it's a little bit tricky. You gotta know where it is. It's the waypoint slash man overboard button, but you have to hold it for three seconds to activate man overboard function. And that will give you a waypoint where you activated that man overboard function. That's gonna be pretty close to your man overboard. So you can navigate back using your chart plotter to that waypoint and hopefully your man overboard hasn't drifted away somewhere. Or even better, he's wearing a MOB AIS beacon and you can see exactly where he is all the time. So that's the initial actions of a man overboard procedure, which would be pretty much the same on any vessel. Now, the rest of picking up your man overboard, as I mentioned, is a complex procedure and there's so many variables that we won't go into it here because it depends on your type of vessel, depends on the wind direction and speed, depends on the waves, depends day or night, depends how many crew you've got. So, too complex to discuss in this short video. Any other crew that has come out to assist, if you have spare crew, assign one guy to just watch. Never take his eyes off the man overboard. That's his only job. And he points and he watches. You can end up a good mile away from your man overboard by the time you can turn the boat around. Just depends on the sails, the wind conditions. Uh, it may be some time before you stop the boat. If you're running downwind, you've got spinnakers to drop things like that. So if you can assign one crew to just simply be the watcher, any other crew will help control the boat.
What happens if you disobey rule number one? What's rule number one again? Keep the water on the outside. Good girl. This is where our other safety equipment comes into play. Life raft, EPIRBs, grab bags, flares. This is obviously a real emergency. This is the equipment that you'll need. Okay, so life raft, not critical, but a really good idea for an ocean crossing, even on a catamaran, which is in theory unsinkable, even upside down, it should keep floating if it's designed nicely. But what about fire? Fire can burn a boat down to the waterline, even aluminium. So it's nice to have another boat to get into. We bought this one just before we started the Indian Ocean. It's a Viking six man with provisions and uh, it cost about 4,000 US dollars. They only have a service life of about three years. So we have to get it serviced in that interval and it'll probably cost between one to one and a half thousand to service. The reason that has this short intervals because there is food and water in there as well as pyrotechnics, there's flares, etc. So they need to be changed out. Easy to uh, deploy on the rear beam here, the aft beam. Simply open these latches and she'll fall into the water. The lanyard is tied to the boat. So once it drifts away enough or once it's clear of the boat, we can pull the lanyard and activate the CO2 canister, which will blow apart this hard case and inflate the vessel. Close to the doorway we keep our grab bag. Inside the grab bag is EPIRBs. That's the ship's EPIRB. I was going to mount it somewhere on the boat but I thought why bother it's going to come with us in the life raft. So we keep it in the grab bag. Also got a personal EPIRB and some flares. And of course a charged, I have to charge this one, a BHF handheld waterproof radio. Another important component to safety on board is fire protection. Make sure you've got your extinguishers, they're in date. Don't have to be in date, but best if they are. More likely to work in that case. We've got three extinguishers, we've got one in each of the engine compartments or in that cabin one up here under the electronics in the electronics bay. We also have a smoke alarm in the uh, electronics area. Normally cooking we uh, are pretty close to the galley so we don't have a smoke alarm there but you can although it's probably going to go off all the time under normal operations. Uh, also in the galley we have fire blanket which is great to just throw over the cooktop to uh, starve the oxygen. So make sure you get your fire protection in order. So to wrap up safety gear and procedures, we do our best to follow rule number two, stay on the boat. If we fail that rule, then we have emergency gear and procedures to go back and get our man. If we disobey rule number one, we fail to keep the water on the outside of the boat and we sink, then we have our emergency equipment, life raft and other gear which will help us survive and hopefully initiate a rescue. So that just about covers our safety gear and procedures. The priorities are the two golden rules. If you follow them you won't need any of this but like most of us we're human mistakes happen. That's when you need procedures in place and the right safety gear. Well, that brings us to the end of our 10 point list, but I'm not done. I've got one more bonus point I want to talk about, and that is mental preparedness and risk awareness. I hope by now uh, I've got my point across that you need to prepare for things to go wrong. And then when they do go wrong, you know 
exactly what to do. Have a plan, have redundancy, have backup equipment that can complete the job. Think about what can fail. Engines can fail, sails can fail, crew can fail, whether they become sick or worse. The biggest thing you need to accept in your mind before you leave is there's no one there to help you. Unless you go with a organized rally, which is you know a good way to start off with ocean passages, then there's lots of boats around and someone can come to help you within a day or so. But the point of this list is to prepare you so you don't need to ask for help. If you do need to ask for help, it's an emergency. So when you're on passage, and we'll talk about this more when we are crossing the Atlantic Ocean, but when you're on passage, you need to manage the risk. There's risk all the time on a boat, day-to-day -day life anywhere, there is risk. You need to manage it because there's no doctor, there's no hospital. So when it's slippery on the boat, be very, very careful. Do not slip overboard. Do not fall. Do not hurt yourself. Do not cut yourself. When you're cleaning a fish, do not cut yourself because it could be an infection and incapacitating within a few days. Manage risks. This is not a race. This is about endurance. This is about keeping going. You don't need to stress the boat. You don't need to stress yourself. It's endurance. You've got a long way to go, a lot of miles. It's going to take many days. So do it carefully. So if you follow these steps, two golden rules, then we can reach exotic places like this. And I know for many of you, the Caribbean is just in your backyard. But for us Aussies and Filipinas, it's a half a world away. So we're pleased that we're here. Beautiful. So we finally finished. <laughs> <laughs> 10 points plus one, plus two golden rules. I hope you guys enjoyed it and get something out of it. It's certainly taken a fair bit of our effort. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed this series. Um, there's a lot of info, as I say, you could make a video on each of those topics easily. In fact, we almost did. So guys, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Leave some feedback. Tell us what you think. And stay tuned for the exciting one of actually crossing the South Atlantic Ocean. Cheers. Remember. Knowledge keeps you cruising. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>